Okay, we're back. We're live for the 11 o'clock block here on a given Thursday at ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. We have the honor of talking to Peter Wolf, who is a federal public defender and uh, who joins us from his home, a remote, uh, to talk about mm, a lot of things re around uh, prosecutorial discretion and uh, executive pardons. Uh, welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, Jay. Good morning. Good morning. You know, uh, uh, you're actually the perfect guy to discuss this with because you're on the defense side, but you've seen the process go for years and years. And, and um, you know, you can take a good mm, 50,000 foot level discussion at it. I mean, a viewpoint at it. And so I guess what started me off on the subject is the headline in the Star Advertiser that, um, that William Barr, the Attorney General of the United States, decided to, uh, I guess, pull the case against, uh, against Flint. Um, Flynn, who was uh, prosecuted by Mueller, Flynn, who was convicted by Mueller uh, in a federal court, uh, Flynn, who was uh, sentenced to go to jail, who went to jail, and uh, the little sounds of, of pardon have been leaking out of the White House for a while, and now this. And it's, it's like a pardon, but it's, it's something more, I guess, than a pardon. It like wipes the slate clean. Am I right about that? I think that's right. Uh, but Flynn actually was never sentenced. He was just scheduled for sentencing. Okay. He, uh, uh, before his sentencing came up, he changed lawyers and then uh, sought to uh, withdraw his guilty plea. And uh, so he was never sentenced. But now uh, the Attorney General has uh, essentially moved to uh, dismiss the prosecution. And, uh, you know, it's, I would say, highly unusual that this happens and it's even maybe more unusual that it happens in a case where the defendant pled guilty uh, rather than was convicted after a jury trial and then the government discovered some real problem with their case like, like a lying witness or withheld exculpatory information or something like that. Here, as I understand the record, uh, General Flynn pled guilty to making a false statement at one point uh, the judge interrogated him again under oath to make sure he wanted to stand by uh, that guilty plea, which he said he did. Uh, that was when the first sentencing was coming up. And then uh, now here, maybe two years later, the government wants to quit on the case. Yeah, well, it's uh, uh, remarkable. Does this, I mean, does this happen? Does this happen when years down the road after so much process has gone on, so much media has gone on, uh, that the prosecutorial, prosecutorial authority decides it wants to make, you know, pull the case, make it disappear as if it never happened. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. Have you? Uh, I can't remember anything like that. I think it's, it's so unusual that you could probably say it was unique. Uh, if anything like it has happened, uh, I'm not aware of it. And, uh, and it, and it seems like the uh, issue that the Attorney General is relying on is that somehow the FBI acted unfairly when they went and asked Flynn questions, um, and then he lied to them. Um, I think it's pretty routine in investigations that if people are decide that they'll be interviewed by an FBI agent, that the agents more or less expect that they're going to lie or hope they're going to lie. And, uh, and, it, and it happens with some frequency. And uh, to then say that it was unfair that the agents acted the way they did, well, maybe it was unfair, except that it's pretty routine that that's what, what is part of the interview, to give people the opportunity to lie, because uh, a lie is almost as good as a confession in terms of convicting you later on. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's very interesting. So the, the other thing that strikes me, <clears throat> and I never did practice in criminal law, I mean, aside when I was in the military, it doesn't count, um, is this, um, usually you, you have the, the prosecutor with the discretion, and he's out there in the field, he's like the U.S. attorney. Um, now, this is not the U.S. attorney making this decision. This is the uh, attorney general of the state. He's levels and layers above any U.S. attorney. They all work for him, essentially. Um, and I, you know, that makes it even more remarkable, doesn't it? 
Well, yes. I mean, you know, Flynn was a member of the uh, cabinet. He was a national security advisor for a period of maybe about two weeks. So that, I think, makes him a cabinet level official, although he's not subject to Senate confirmation. And, uh, you know, so everything about this case is unusual. The fact that the national security advisor was prosecuted, the fact that uh, he pled guilty, the fact that the attorney general uh, has intervened. And of course, what's most unusual about anything at all is that the president has, uh, President Trump has made no secret um, of his view that in effect, Barr should intervene in this matter because he's repeatedly talked about how Flynn was treated unfairly and how the FBI um, acted unfairly and how about James Colby uh, was a no good person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, it makes it, you know, it, it sounds like the White House has its hands, its fingerprints all over this. Most recently, I saw something in the paper about how the president was considering rehiring Flynn and bringing him back into the White House, which is even more extraordinary. If that happens, that's, that's going to be um, right at the end of the tale, uh, one extraordinary step after another. Yeah, I mean, if, if I remember correctly, at, on the Supreme Court building, which is, uh, you know, uh, styled after, I think, the Parthenon in Athens, anyway, a Greek uh, revival building, giant building in Washington, D.C., there's a huge inscription across the front of it, equal justice under law, but um, I don't think this case would give any American citizen any particular confidence that equal justice under law is actually a real thing, particularly when you're talking about cases in which the president has a particular interest. I mean, to contrast it, there was an article last week or so that Michael Flint, excuse me, Michael Cohen was going to be uh, released to home confinement because he's in a facility which has quite a few uh, COVID-19 infections and uh, he's, you know, a low risk uh, prisoner, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden it never happened. Um, Cohen was going to be released and then he didn't get released. And then the <coughs> news article suggested that the President Trump was infuriated by the prospect. So, you know, when you contrast those two things, it could give you some real concern about the notion of uh, disinterested, even handed justice for uh, high citizens as well as the low citizens. Yeah, and it goes, this goes into the military too, talking about the military. You have two cases that come to mind. One was the uh, deserter case, Ber Bergdahl, uh, Bo Bergdahl, um, who, uh, when uh, the president was, was running, uh, he took the position over and over again that Bergdahl, sh should, who had not yet been tried, that Bergdahl should be, uh, should be um, hung, thrown out of a plane, shot, all these various fatal punishments. Um, and he continued to uh, re-endorse that position even after he became president. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to qualify as command influence, such as to let Bergdahl off the hook. But um, if, if a commander, a, a true commander in the military had uh, exercised that kind of influence, um, it, would have, it, it would have excused Bergdahl simply uh, under the um, manual for course marshal. The well, other one that, yeah. go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say that reminded me, I think you could contrast the uh, uh, treatment of Captain Crozier of the uh, uh, aircraft carrier Roosevelt versus the uh, president's treatment of, uh, was it, uh, I don't know what his rank was, Mr. Gallagher of the uh, SEAL team, who was actually convicted in a court martial and then uh, <clears throat> and then reinstated or pardoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to mention, yeah, uh, that's another example of the president's uh, fingerprints all over a case that's several tears down um, for reasons that, you know, the, the public is not likely to buy, or at least in, in the Gallagher case, uh, the, the military legal infrastructure is not likely to buy. I think, uh, although, you know, he courts the military, the uh, fact is he lost a lot of support within at least the officer ranks in the military when he did that. But this, this comes to that inscription you mentioned about, about confidence, about public confidence. Um, you know, it's, and it's the George Washington statement too. Uh, the true administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. 
And, and the true administration of justice is really synonymous with public confidence. So when you do something, when you exercise prosecutorial dis discretion, dis discretion at these very high levels, at the you know, chief executive level, whether you do it through William Barr or you do it in your own name, um, you are, you are you're testing public confidence. And you know, if you lose public confidence, something happens. I mean, somebody like you, public defender or a prosecutor, uh, somebody who's involved in the federal justice system or in the state justice system, you work your whole career to build public confidence. You want the public um, to, to feel good about how the system works, equal justice under the law. Am I right about that? Isn't that sort of central in, in all of the people who work, the judges, the prosecutors, the defenders in the, in the, in the justice system? Well, it is, but I think it's uh, it's an aspirational uh, goal rather than anything that uh, um, actually works out in practice. I mean, you don't have to look too far into the history of the country before you would be, you know, quite concerned about the legacy of uh, Jim Crow laws and uh, racist enforcement of the law and so forth. Uh, it's easy enough to think, oh, well, we're past that, but then you, you know, see some incident and you just realize, well, maybe we're not past that at all. And I think uh, if, if you were a person, which I'm not, and you're not, who was a member of a minority, which is the subject of these things, it would be your, your lived experience on, on a daily basis. So I think it's, it's a worthy goal. And I think there are people working towards it, but the idea that we we're, we're there and that there's just a couple of, uh, you know, odd things here on the margins that we should be concerned about, but really not too much because overall the system's working great. I think that's, uh, that would be a mistake if you, if you thought that. And there's no greater proof needed than the uh, remarkable high percentage of uh, people that the United States incarcerates, both in the federal and the state system. And we have like 4% of the world's population and something like 25% of the world's prisoners. So, yeah, That's... something is wrong with that. Now, when you see prosecutorial um, discretion abused, in my, in my view anyway, uh, in the case of this uh, the Flynn um, incident today, um, and in the case of the, you know, the other cases we've mentioned, I mean, Roger Stone is another one where a number of prosecutors um, walked out. One of them quit the job, quit his career over recommendations uh, to Amy, Amy Berman ja Jackson, the judge on what the punishment should be. Um, these, are, these are really awful examples of how it's gone off the side. And, and my question to you, and maybe the answer is different for different cases, but my question is what, what is the relief if, um, if, if we all conclude that a given exercise of um, executive or um, prosecutorial discretion was wrong in some way, what can be done about it? Can Congress fix it? Uh, can other courts fix it? Um, what what can we do? I think it, at this level, at the presidential level, there's not too much. Is there anything? Yeah, I think at this level, there's not too much. But really, at any level, there's not too much. I mean, the theory of prosecutorial discretion is that the prosecutor needs to have discretion so they can make uh, decisions without uh, fear uh, of political reprisal or without uh, favoring one person or the other. And that it's a necessary, I guess, corollary to the idea of, uh, of a separate branches. Uh, but, you know, it's subject to abuse. And I think the real issue when it's subject to abuse is, is, is relief through the uh, ballot box or through getting rid of the prosecutor who the citizens decide has abused his discretion. And if that were to happen, then that's about the only relief. I mean, you have a potential for relief if you could prove that the discretion was a decision to prosecute uh, based on, you know, like, for example, a racial uh, motive. There, the court, if, if that could be proved, could provide relief. But when the exercise of discretion is a decision not to prosecute or to end a prosecution, there's really nothing at all that can 
be done. And, and maybe even that's the right way the law should be, but then you have um, circumstances like uh, this Flynn case, which would give you um, pause when you're thinking about it. Well, you know, that leaves the media, I guess. Uh, and it leaves the professional organizations like the Bar Association, the ABA, um, but uh, they haven't really spoken up about this. The media have covered it and with certain, you know, uh, I mean, I believe there's more op-ed going on these days about these issues, but um, you can't do much legally if you're the media. And for that matter, you can't do much uh, if you're the Bar Association. For example, all these uh, right-wing judges that are being appointed and, uh, and uh, immediately confirmed uh, the Bar Association doesn't treat them as qualified. A lot of them do not get a qualified rating from the ABA, and yet they are immediately confirmed. Um, you know, even this week, there are a number of appointments that are being confirmed because uh, the Senate came back in, not to work on the coronavirus, but, but to work on uh, con uh, quick, quick uh, confirmations. But let me ask you one more thing, Peter, and that is about pardons, because it strikes me, I don't know if you will agree, but it strikes me that what happened with, uh, with Flynn and Barr today, um, that was in lieu of a pardon. Uh, and in, indeed, there were discussions and rumors and the like that the president was going to pardon him as he has threatened to pardon or rumored to pardon others. Uh, was this a, a, a clever shift of attention from a pardon to a withdrawal of the, of the prosecution? Was there a good reason for it? Does it stand up as a, 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 better, a, a better approach uh, within the federal prosecution, prosecutorial system? Well, I think it takes the uh, pressure off the president. Now, he doesn't have to pardon you know, Flynn. He expressed his opinion on many occasions that Flynn was treated unfairly. Now, Barr says, uh, using my discretion as the chief prosecutor of the United States, and we're going to quit on this uh, case, and, and that's that. So it, it does have implications for the pardon power. I mean, the, here's the ironic thing. The pardon power is probably used far too uh, few times rather than too many times. Uh, but there, and, and you can see it. And you, I mean, the person who, the president who pardoned the most people or commuted their sentences was Obama. But he even pardoned very uh, many fewer people than probably should have been. And we just have these remarkably draconian sentencing laws that have been in effect for 30 years and, and the effects are felt all across the country. And many states have the same. The problem is, is the people who get pardoned, and, and this is through many administrations, a lot of them seem to be people who are friends of the president or connected to fundraisers for the president or in, in state systems, people who uh, uh, are connected to the sitting governor. And the fact that a lot of pardons are issued as on the last day of, in office uh, kind of tells the tale because that means that the interest in doing something about it uh, has to wane because there's nothing you can do about it. So, you know, I think that there's more people that need to be pardoned. I mean, with Trump, you can see people who come to his attention through Kim Kardashian or otherwise, those people, who aren't politically connected, a few of them, two or three, got a part, and they probably deserved it. And uh, on the other hand, it strikes me that there ought to be a better way to identify people who ought to be subject to some executive clemency than, you know, Kim Kardashian had to take an interest in your case because with hundreds of thousands of people in jail, you know, her resources and attention span have to be limited as well. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and uh, as with these other, uh, approaches, um, a pardon is unchallengeable. And there's nothing you can do if a, if a, a president decides to pardon or not to pardon, you, you can't take him up on it. There's no further authority that could question his, his decision process. I mean, for example, in the case of Sheriff Arapaio, I think right. that was Arizona, that was clearly an abuse, but there it was. It was a pardon of a fellow who nobody could feel should be pardoned. But there's no way to challenge it, except in the press. That's right. Arpaio was convicted of contempt for refusing the federal court's orders and uh, was scheduled for sentencing. So I guess in that respect, uh, he may be in a similar legal situation as 
General Flynn was. He was awaiting sentencing. It hadn't been imposed yet. And then there was intervention by a pardon process rather than by the, uh, uh, a withdrawal of the prosecution. But the result was pretty much the same. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to see more of that. And uh, from the point of view of, of, of a defender, public defender, it must be of some concern that um, uh, we're not seeing pardons where we would see them uh, to provide equal, equal justice. Sometimes the court system doesn't work quite right. And there should be a way to um, create equal justice, uh, a la sort of a last clear chance to create equal justice. Um, but the executive uh, with the pardon authority has to be uh, willing to uh, uh, hear uh, requests for pardons. Does a defender ever make requests for pardons? Uh, infrequently. It's, uh, you know, historically the pardon uh, power has been used very, very sparingly. There was an office, or there still is an office of the pardon attorney in the Department of Justice, uh, and they almost never supported a pardon or commutation of sentence. That was one of the issues that I think in the Obama administration that they tried to do something about it, to speed up the process a little bit or make it a little uh, uh, more subject to some, um, you know, flexibility. I mean, it's pretty unlikely that a professional career prosecutor is going to ever think that a sentence was too long or was unfair or should be changed by commutation. And so, you know, that office wasn't very much supportive of uh, pardons. And uh, so to the extent that it gets into a situation where more pardons were, would be considered seriously and maybe granted, I think that would be a good thing. Uh, but I do have some real concerns about the idea that you have to be connected to the president, you have to be his pal, or at least a friend of his friend to uh, get anywhere. That strikes me as the wrong direction for this to go. Yeah, some people would say it's, it's open abuse. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for this discussion, even on short notice. I hope we can circle back and follow other events that are sure to unfold uh, in this administration. Thank you, Jay. Oh, before we go, we have a question. And I, I would, I always want to take the opportunity. Here's a question. Um, what is the status of the Kaloha cases right now? To follow up on an earlier show where you appeared on Think Tank. Right. So when the uh, court, the federal court shut down uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, threat, uh, those cases were all continued. Uh, every case would continue, and, and they were, um, those defendants were among those that would continue. I think the court is in the process, I know the court's in the process of examining how or when to do a partial reopening of the courthouse and then how to schedule hearings. And then uh, ultimately, uh, the concern is how would you conduct the jury trials? But so those cases are on, on hold until the court reopens, but uh, they haven't. The cases haven't gone away. Uh, they'll come up for the sentencing before Judge Seabright at some point once the uh, court reopens for more or less regular business. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Aloha. Thanks. Thanks.